Hello, it's Scott Manley. It's July 3rd and it's really time for another Deep Space update. I've been so distracted I kind of forgot to record one. And we've had a lot of rocket launches in the last uh, almost couple of weeks. The first one was a big one. It was a uh, Korea's Nuri or KSLV-2. That's their Korea satellite launch vehicle. This actually launched while I was actually recording the previous one and a lot of people were disappointed I missed it in the middle of the SpaceX launch of Palooza. But yes, uh, Korea have developed, this is their first domestically developed launch vehicle. It's a three-stage liquid fueled, it's about 200 tons, it will put maybe 2.5 tons into low Earth orbit, runs on kerosene, or sorry, it actually runs on Jet A and liquid oxygen. So anyway, this was their second launch attempt, and unlike the previous one, it was successful. Previously, the um, the third stage had failed. It had stopped like 30, 46 seconds, 46 seconds early, yes. And therefore, the thing had never reached orbit and burned up. But this one was a complete success. All the payloads are into orbit. They put, uh, I think, six payloads into sun-synchronous orbit. There was... Uh, like a performance package, there was a mass simulator, which I guess technically isn't a payload. And it was actually a handful of CubeSats for various Korean universities. I think it was four of them. So congratulations, Korea, on your first uh, successfully launched, your domestically developed launch vehicle. 22nd of June, China launched a Kwaizu rocket. This was a return to flight after a previous failure of a Kwaizu. Uh, the Kwaizu is a three a three four stage um, solid rocket motor very you know, small rapid response light light launch vehicle and we uh, it failed previously but this time it was successful it was carrying a satellite called Tiangsing one which we know basically nothing about we do know that it's gone into a low sun synchronous orbit like 280 kilometers or thereabouts uh, we're told that it is going to measure the space environment. What exactly that entails? I don't know. Uh, 22nd of June, Ariane Space launched an Ariane 5. This was their first launch of 2022. The last time Ariane 5 launched, it was carrying the James Webb Space Telescope. And we're now looking forward to getting the first real images from it on you know, July 12th. So we're almost... That entire space has been almost without a single Ariane 5 launch. But this was a commercial launch for Ariane Space carrying a pair of satellites into geostationary orbit. Uh, the one is MEASAT-3D, that's for Malaysia, which I believe is replacing an, an, a, an existing satellite. And then there's GSAT-24 being launched for India. So, um, yeah, I mean, those were successful, Ariane Five is a really successful, reliable launch vehicle, and those satellites are on their way. Um, 23rd of June, China launched a Long March 2D, carrying a trio of low Earth orbit reconnaissance satellites for the uh, Chinese military. These are named Yao Gan, and honestly, we don't know anything about them right now, although, you know, we'll be watching and figuring out what they're doing. 27th of June, there was another Long March, a Long March 4C. This was carrying a communication satellite. Sorry, no, it was carrying a civilian Earth observation satellite called Gaofen 12. And this was launched into sun synchronous orbit. We know this is the civilian side of their Earth observation. Um, beyond that, I'm not sure what else to say. <laughs> but the 28th of June, we had a Falcon 9. And this was carrying uh, the... SES-22 satellite into geostationary orbit. This is only the second geostationary SpaceX launch of the year. So, and, and this is actually part of a sort of interesting program. The FCC is trying to get satellite operators in geostationary orbit to replace the satellites or stop their satellites working on certain frequencies which will be used by 5G cellular. And there's like a huge, you know, billions of dollars going to be given to these companies if they replace them in time. So this is one of those satellites that's needed by SES to replace old technology so that they can operate on bands that won't interfere with uh, 5G and, of course, you know, implanting the virus and all that other weird stuff that conspiracy idiots like. Yeah, uh, 30th of June. We have India making a launch, PSLV, the Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle. It carried a number of satellites, but actually the main customer in this case was Singapore. Um, so they were carrying a pair of like Earth observation satellites. One was for the military, one was for a 
like a private operator. And there was also an experimental experiment module, which carries, you know, CubeSats on board with, uh, you know, payloads for various companies, not just not just Singapore, but India and stuff as well. That was into low Earth orbit, I believe. The 1st of July, finally, after a couple of scrubs, uh, the Atlas V-541 carrying NSS, NSF, sorry, NSSF-12, which is, of course, the... <laughs> the you know the space force right For, they were basically carrying a couple of satellites into geostationary orbit so one of these is called the wfov and that is a technology test bed for it means wide field of view they're carrying new sensors for missile detection and currently the satellites that are doing missile detection are part of the espers spurs space base infrared system and those are currently launching in fact i believe the final sixth satellite of the spurs constellation is going to be launching on an atlas 5 soon uh, i'm not sure what the other satellite was but uh, yeah pair of satellites doing cool stuff in space they so they had a lot of problems with weather like they were they had the rocket ready to go and then a thunder cloud literally parked itself over the top and the electrical potential between the sky and the ground was simply too high to risk launching a rocket through it because you would get conduction back down towards the surface. And on Friday night, on the 2nd of July, Virgin Orbit, or uh, yeah, it launched, um, Virgin Orbit launched a rocket called uh, Straight Up, right? It was <laughs> nicknamed Straight Up after, because Virgin, of course, they like to reference records that were released by Virgin Records. So we had tubular bells and above the clouds. Now we've got Straight Up, which, of course, uh, that was Paula Abdul's sort of first big hit in the mid, uh, early 90s, late 80s. No, yeah, it must be late 80s. And yeah, I actually have a copy of that on 12 inch vinyl. That was my dad's, though. So yeah, I still think that's a cool tune. But anyway, that launch carried seven small satellites for the Space Force. Uh, was successful. It was their first night launch. And while it was launching, I literally stepped out of my deck and I could see this tiny red dot way low on the horizon just before it disappeared behind the clouds. So very happy to have seen that. Great to see Virgin Orbit having a success there. But actually, possibly the most exciting launch of the week in terms of reaction on the ground probably has to be the launch of a Black Brandt uh, sounding rocket carrying an X-ray telescope from uh, Arnhem Launch Centre in Northern Australia, right? This is uh, this is Equatorial Launch Australia as the company that runs this. They offer to offer, you know, launch site for commercial operators and NASA wanted to launch their sounding rocket from there. It's actually going to be one of three. And yeah, you know, they don't get many rocket launches in Australia. And this one, boy, this reaction is priceless. Five, four, three, two, one, go! So in orbit at the International Space Station, the Cygnus spacecraft uh, came to the end of its mission. It uh, performed or demonstrated a reboost to the space station, lifting the apogee of the orbit by 0.8 kilometers in a sustained burn of a few minutes, then undocked and disposed of itself. Uh, also in the space station, there's uh, still a lot of discussion about whether a Russian astronaut will fly on uh, SpaceX Dragon later this year. but. We heard that Anna Kakina, who is the only female Russian cosmonaut and has been unable to, has been bumped from several Soyuz missions. She's traveled to the US to train with crew members of Crew 5. Yeah, we're not clear whether the deal is still going to work these days. We know that the Russian parliament has actually said yes, but we don't know whether Roscosmos and NASA have come to an agreement. But at this time, she is currently training and is being fitted for a SpaceX pressure suit. Uh, OneWeb, they have signed a deal with Relativity Space to use the second generation Terran R launch vehicle. So Relativity, they're the ones that are 3D printing their rockets and they have, they have already looked at their sort of next step and their next step is like a mini version of Starship that's going to perform a two-stage, it'll be a two-stage rocket with the second stage performing a complete recovery. Yeah, 
Um, so OneWeb have stepped up with a bunch of money to say that they will launch their satellites on this vehicle. And that is a big win for relativity if they can make a fully reusable small launch vehicle. Like Starship is obviously gobsmackingly amazingly amazing, but it is so big. Not everybody is going to need a Starship to launch hundreds of tons into low Earth orbit. So if if Relativity could make something Starship-like that is a two-stage fully recoverable vehicle and uh, make it smaller, that it's more, you, know, you don't need to buy an entire launch vehicle, um, you know, they could actually do very well with it. I mean, their 3D printing thing still feels like something of a gimmick, but, uh, you know, they obviously believe in the technology and if they say it makes it easier, great, more power to them. Anyway... Uh, oh, by the way, OneWeb, just so you know, they've also signed agreements with SpaceX and uh, you know, I ISRO, so it, they have other options for launching their satellites right now. This is just a, I guess this is what they would like to do. Um, okay, and in the last few weeks, one of the big pieces of news was NASA's Spacesuit uh, Award. If you remember, they are switching from basically paying companies to build spacesuits for them and buying the suits. They're now going to pay companies to build the spacesuits, maintain the spacesuits, and basically hire, rent the spacesuits for specific missions. And this is called the XEVAs program. There were two winners, there were uh, Collins Aerospace and Axiom Space. And finally, because it was a, like supposed to be a competitive bid, they had to publish a source selection statement explaining you know, the background to it and why these ones were picked. And the reasons why these ones were picked was because nobody else bid. There were only two companies that bid for the entire thing. There was a third that started and then stopped. It's not clear why there's so few. Like SpaceX was definitely there as an interested party and they have their own suits, but they didn't want to go all the way through this procurement process. And so, yeah, the only thing that we really got to know is that they, the two companies are pretty competitive in terms of their quality. Axiom was about 20% cheaper than Collins. Both of them were cheaper than what the independent cost estimate from NASA was going to be. So that's a, that's a good sign. Also, Axiom was in space news for the, in a couple of weeks because, well, okay, they, they are getting, uh, they're converting an old Fry's electronics store to be one of their office buildings. And I don't know, if you don't live, if you've never been to a Fry's store, they were these electronic stores that had everything. In fact, they carried all sorts of stuff that wasn't electronics, but they would always have their stores built around some theme. The one in Palo Alto was like Gold Rush and it had all this like hokey, you know, 49ers style statues and stuff. But the one I think in Texas and Houston specifically was designed to look like a giant space station module. And they had like a space station mock-up hanging from the ceiling. So Axiom taking this over and converting it to office spaces, I'm like, thank God that's going to be preserved because that is a work of modern cultural art that we would not want to lose. Fry's closed last year because, you know, brick and mortar stores couldn't really compete with uh, COVID and mail order. Um, another thing that can't compete with forces that are external to it is the Psyche mission. It has been pulled from the launch schedule for this year because the software is simply not ready and, and won't be ready in time for the launch window. And you know, let's be clear, this is a space mission. It's quite common for the software not to be ready at launch, but to be then continued developed and uploaded once it gets you know towards its target. This happens all the time with, with NASA spacecraft. I mean, if you think about it, why spend all that time developing software if it's just going to explode, right? <laughs> like, oh, it's in space now. Now we should finish developing our software. Well, whatever they needed to develop, they couldn't get it all done in time. And so it's going to have to look at launch windows in future years. And it's not sure, not really clear what those will look like. Uh, because, you know, these missions, they tend to need gravity assists. I believe it might actually be possible to get to Psyche with a, Sync, a Falcon 9 instead of a Falcon Heavy, depending upon their launch window. Uh, it is interesting that Psyche was sort of a relatively cheap mission as, as things go. And one of the ways they cut costs was by using commercial spacecraft buses. Like the thing is built around uh, 
a 1300 model space you know, satellite bus, which is a very common design used for a lot of communication satellites. That meant that it had a lot of hardware on it that wasn't developed in-house at NASA, and that presumably meant that it had all its own software and you have to integrate that with NASA software. Maybe that might have caused a problem. Regardless, we'll see where that goes finally. SLS is back in the vehicle assembly building after enough of a successful wet dress rehearsal that I think they're moving forward with a plan to launch it. Uh, we'll know exactly when that happened. When, when, we'll know exactly when that happens, I guess, when it actually lifts off. <laughs> Uh, that, remember a few months ago there was a mysterious rocket booster in space that was falling towards the moon and at first people were like, oh, it's this, it's SpaceX booster and it's, you know, they shouldn't be littering the moon. And then it was like, oh, it's a, a Chinese booster. It's, they shouldn't be littering the moon. Well, now it finally hit the moon and we've found the crater. So the crater was found about eight kilometers away from where JPL predicted. And it's kind of interesting because it looks like a double crater. So these two images, you can see the changes. It's kind of hard to pick it out initially because the lighting changes from one to the other. But if you invert the lighting on one of them, then suddenly the illumination looks a little easier and you can see where uh, you see it a little easier. I have no idea why it produced a double crater. Like, if it came in at a very low angle, it might produce that, but I think the impact angle here was about 15 degrees, so that couldn't be it. Maybe the spacecraft has a you know big heavy mass at one end and a big heavy mass at the other. Yeah, I, I, w it, we're not really sure. But anyway, that's, uh, that's the crater. Finally, 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 wow, this has been quite a long one. SpaceX uh, have got authorization from the Federal Communications Commission to allow mobile base stations for Starlink on in the US. That means you can in fact you will in fact be able to have Starlink built into cars and operating while driving. So that's quite a big deal and I won't be surprised if we see Tesla starting to have these things uh, operate in some form or another. It, they might not have the big high bandwidth dish. They might have smaller versions but uh, yeah, I, I won't be surprised if we see that as an option for a Tesla going forwards. So anyway, uh, that's most of the news I can think of. I think the big thing we're looking forward to in the next 10 days or so, of course, is the reveal of the images from the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, but until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.